workshop today. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, France de Marais as our first speaker. Uh, France is the Director of Programs and Partnerships uh, at the uh, headquarters of the International Councils of Museums in Paris. As the Director of Programs and Partnerships, she is um, particularly focusing on uh, emergency preparedness and responses <coughs> for museums, the development of training programs for, uh, for museum professionals, and also uh, on the international, international fight against illicit trafficking. Uh, and one of the uh, programs of uh, France and ICOM are the renowned Red List, and there are several of them that have been translated also into Turkish, together with the Ministry of Culture uh, and Tourism uh, on Iraq, for example, it uh, has been translated. Um, sorry. She is also <coughs> responsible for ICOM's risk, uh, disaster risk management committee and is a representative of the Blue Shield, an organization that has been named several times already. Uh, France was also involved in writing the charter for UNESCO, uh, the recommendations for the protection on promotion of museums and collections, their diversity and role in society and she is now, she also serves now on the advisory board of the new uh, Cultural Protection Fund of the British Council in the UK, uh, Programme Fund uh, of the, in the UK. And today she is going to talk to us about protection, uh, protecting cultural heritage at risk, the role of the World Museum Community. Please. Do we have the microphone, the, the portable one? Yes, Sorry. it's coming. I, I worried about the pointer, but not about having a microphone. Sorry. Um, good afternoon, thank you for coming back. Um, I'm really happy to be here. My name is France de Marais. I'm from Canada. I always need to say this. I feel better after because since I wear the name of the country and my office is based in Paris, there might be uh, misconceptions. I have the pleasure and the honor of working at ICOM, the International Council of Museums, and I will explain to you a little bit what we do in the protection of cultural heritage at risk. I think um, although we're a 70-year-old organization, we're not as well known um, to non-museum professionals, so I will explain that. And since my colleagues spoke very eloquently this morning about very specific aspects of disaster risk management and training, I will, we also do that, but I will focus, to make sure we're complementary, I will focus on illicit traffic and cultural goods, which is our core uh, business when it comes to uh, protecting heritage at risk. It's something we've been doing for a long time. Um, and I will talk about the responsibility of museums, um, as I think there are museum professionals um, in the room. So I will explain how, as museum professionals, we have a role, we have a responsibility, and we can um, do a lot to protect cultural heritage at risk. First, of course, what is ICOM? It is a global organization of 36,000 members, individual museum professionals and institution present in 140 countries. We work in French, in English, and in Spanish, and we, are, um, we have been created in 1946. The story goes we pre-existed UNESCO um, as early as the 20s, as more of an um, inter-ministerial body, and then ICOM was created as an NGO when UNESCO was created so we could really be the operational um, arm of UNESCO on matters of museums. We, the, the department have the pleasure um, of managing, is in charge of the international public service missions of ICOM. Setting standards for museum professional, building capacities, so that includes training, and of course protecting cultural heritage at risk. 
I, in emergency and for those in traffic, the two aspects. Um, I won't talk about capacity building if we want to um, remain in the time frame. So I will just quickly um, talk, say one thing about standards and development and then focus on protecting cultural heritage at risk. Museums in a dangerous time, I realize this is a famous song in Canada only. So it's called um, Something in a Dangerous Time and I usually use this title but I realize the joke doesn't work on anybody else that's not from Canada. Uh, but it has been a period of traumatic times for museums. And where we've heard it a bit this morning, and Brian touched on this, it's important to understand that we used to work on preparing for disasters and natural disasters, catastrophe. And now we've been solely working on human-made um, conflict and war and disasters. Museum professional had not dealt with this since the Second World War, so we're not prepared for this, we're not trained for this, and I come had a response mechanism uh, created after the tsunami, which was mainly focusing on disasters, and now we had to adapt. So we will talk about this because it's a transformative period, but it also brought many challenges, but it also is bringing opportunities for uh, the sector, and I think if we seize this moment, we can probably make a difference. One word on standard setting. Um, first, the most important standard for ICOM is the code of ethics for museum. So if you're a museum professional, it's a very small, short book. If you haven't read it in a while, please read it again. Um, it's the only international standard on ethical practice for a museum. There are national codes, but it's the internationally recognized code. It is enshrined in the new UNESCO recommendation on museums and collection. The definition of museum, of ICOM, and the ICOM Code of Ethics have been recognized, and this has been adopted by 195 state parties to UNESCO. So that includes Turkey. It means, as a museum professional, you can use it um, to make sure that either your museum law or your government or your leadership is abiding by these principles that are backed by the international community. The last time we had a um, standard setting instrument at UNESCO solely focusing on museum was in 1960 and it was about making museums accessible to all classes of citizen and all types and it's still very relevant but this one is a bit broader and brings back the focus of what is the core uh, responsibilities and work on museums, preservation, research and communication. Now, talking about our main focus on protecting cultural heritage at risk, um, ICOM is one, Peter Stone yesterday did not have a chance to um, mention that the Blue Shield was created by the four international NGOs on cultural heritage. ICOM for museums, ICOMAS for sites, IFLA for libraries, and ICA for archives. Those are four NGOs um, that represent the, these four sectors of movable and immovable cultural heritage. They created the Blue Shield and ICOM in 2005 after the Asian tsunami created a task force for museums because so many small private museums were destroyed that the government wasn't taking part, wasn't um, helping them because they weren't national museums and they had huge needs. And there was this wave of help. Museum professionals from all over the world felt that they needed to support the distress and came to ICOM, gave donations, started building a fund, and we started creating a task force and we realized that uh, it's really important to be solidary. So sometimes, recently I met with a colleague from Haiti because they had another uh, natural disaster recently, and they said, just that letter, just that email you sent immediately in the aftermath, knowing we are not alone, um, changes everything. So it's not only about this, but it's also about being solidary and knowing that we support our colleagues as best we can from around the world. So why should museum be concerned about illicit traffic in cultural goods, other than the fact that everybody should be concerned about illicit traffic? Because museums suffer twice from illicit traffic. Museums host collections that can be stolen. It's one of the four or five places of conservation that can be the um, object of a theft. Second, you can host willingly, but hopefully unwillingly, 
uh, looted material because somebody could sell it on the market and the museum is acquiring and you could buy it not knowing it was looted, then you have to deal with restitution and, uh, and ownership disputes, but also because a donator, for example, a collector would have uh, bought it years ago, we will think it has a clear provenance and it will end up in the museum collection. So museums have every reason to be of utmost concern with this issue and we have a responsibility. So what is our role? Very quickly, the reason why we're active in this um, is because museums are um, faced with this and also it's something that each museum can tackle but that we need to tackle at the global level. And ICON being the object expert is part of an international um, organizations group. So all these other five organizations are intergovernmental. We're the only NGO in this group as the object expert. And the reason why I show this is because we need to understand that there's a momentum. The G7, that, so the most uh, industrialized countries in the world, met for the first time talking about culture. So the first time they decide to talk about culture, the only reason to talk about it is protecting cultural heritage at risk. Because of the destruction, the CEO of the Louvre, an Italian minister, was able to convince them that this is a global issue, that we have a responsibility, we have a duty, we could probably contribute to the solution, and that ministers of the G7 should meet. So for the first time this year, the G7 um, countries met to talk about culture, and ICOM was convened, again, the only NGO in this group, and I don't say this to toot our own horn, I say this to make us understand that this is the level we've reached, the level of policy, the level of interest. So for the first time, we are not alone, and this is the good news. Because in the past, I will talk about it when we talk about the Red List, we were very much alone. So we need to seize their opportunity to make them put their money where their mouth is. So we need to go from talking to acting. So practically, what are the tools that are at hand? Somebody mentioned inventory this morning. Of course, usually I say three solutions to protect the collection, inventory, inventory, inventory. It is really the most important thing. Um, Object ID is an international standard that was developed with the uh, Getty Information Institute at the time and the international community to agree on the basic ways to inventory. And if you have an inventory that's compatible with object identification, it can be put on the Interpol database very quickly, if ever it was stolen. We, ICOM has had the red list for over 17 years now, um, and I will explain a little bit more about the red list later. Very quickly, some, a couple of years ago, um, 2012, the ID came when I started working at ICOM. We created an international observatory on illicit traffic, and the idea was we don't know enough about this, we need to contribute to research, we need to bring the stakeholders at the table and coordinate and share intelligence, share information. What do we know that the others don't know that could help uh, because it's a transnational criminality, nobody can do this alone. And the observatory now has oh, oh, sorry, a website um, that you can consult. It's a platform where you, if you go to the map, browse the map, you will find Turkey, you will see the ministry, you will see what, what are the tools uh, and bodies that are present in Turkey. You will see what Turkey has ratified in terms of um, main uh, cultural conventions. Um, and then there is a glossary, good practices, how do you define due diligence? There's a sheet on there. And we didn't do this alone. We had 12 to 15 experts from different agencies from around the world who all agreed on those. We developed um, a glossary, a couple of case studies. We'll now translate it into French because there's very few resources available other than in English on this topic. And the little story behind this is that when I arrived at ICOM, people used to say it's the third most grossing, I'm sorry for Zainab who's heard this many times, but it's the third most grossing cr criminal activity in the world. There was no data to back it up. Uh, we would say six billion worth of traffic. There was no data to back it up. There was no empirical data that could bring us back to this number. So I didn't want us to, 
continue repeating this, although it looks really good, um, but also I did not want to, when a journalist asks how bad is it, I used to answer very bad. Um, so we have to find a way to gather intelligence. The information is out there, it's not gathered. Why? Because it was considered a cultural problem. And at Interpol, there's very few people dealing with this, and there's more dealing with uh, other types of crime, like drug, for example, drug smuggling. And it's the same case everywhere at the national level. This will now change, but at the time, there was this idea that we needed to gather everything that existed and then prompt research. And the other misconception was, well, there's nothing. Nobody cares about this. There's nothing. We started looking. We found 5,000 resources. There were articles. There were films. There were laws. There were standards. There were guidelines. There were so many things. They were just scattered because in different languages, in, in different parts of the world, and they weren't federated. So we tried to create some kind of data bank where um, you can find what has been published and exists on this topic. And this is when um, I don't toot my own horn at all because I said we will publish, after three years of research, we will publish data. And people who had been in the field longer than me said, you won't be able to do it. It's too difficult, you won't have anything. Over my dead body, we will have data. Well, <laughs> we did not have data three years later because it wasn't global. It was anecdotal, it was, we could say something about one case, but we couldn't publish a um, global view in numbers. But we had quantif quali qualified, uh, quali yeah, qu qualitative. <laughs> qualitative, thank you. Quantitative, qualitative. We didn't have quantitative number, but we had qualitative um, information. So we uh, published some articles from experts from all over the world on the legal framework, on the situation in Iraq and Syria, in Latin America. There is a great article on how to create provenance. We need to show the world that fake provenance exists, and this is how it's done. Um, I saw Neil Brody in one of your sites. Neil Brody wrote on the uh, internet market because it's something that is also changing our practice. So it's not the numbers we wanted to publish, but it may be uh, more useful for the time being because um, it tries to analyze and understand the trade. Now, the practical tool that I can develop. When we used to talk to the art market at the time, they would say, well, we need lists. We can't do anything if we don't have a list. And of course, they meant a list of stolen objects. But when you know that the Interpol database will only have the objects that have been reported stolen to police, and that the main archaeologists in the room will know that most of the things that have been looted and that are out there have not been inventoried yet, and had never been reported as stolen to police. We don't have a description, we don't have a picture, but we know this stuff is looted from different parts of the world, so what do we do? So we come up with um, typologies. So we will give examples to police and customs, visual examples and descriptive examples, to say, well, this is the type of object that you should be on the lookout for. So the art market got its list. I'm not sure they're very happy, that's not what they wanted. Um, how does an object get included, or a type of object, get included on the red list? For example, um, this guy right here. Well, he needs to come, it's, I call it the risk factor. He needs to come from a region that's been at risk, that we know there's been looting, there's been instability, um, and it's potentially or knowingly looted. This is the Islamic Art Museum in Cairo. Um, the legal factors, there are three factors. The second factor is the legal factor. It needs to be protected by national legislation. Turkey is an example in that in which its national legislation is very strong and it protects its cultural heritage. It's not the case everywhere, so it's important that nations do pass legislation that are strong and restrictive, but also that they ratify international legislation. For example, the Unidroit Convention, 1995, has not been ratified by any market country. Not one place in the world that sells these objects has ratified only the source country. So that means it's restrictive enough that it could have an influence on the market, and there's very strong lobby and political resistance to ratifying. So we need to keep pushing to make sure this legislation gets passed, because without it, um, we're a bit at a loss. 
the reason why there's the German logo in there is because Germany um, very courageously passed new legislation last year. And in the le legislation, they've included import certificate as well as export certificate. So a, an object from Iraq, no matter where it is in the world, will not get into Germany without Iraq giving its authorization. So this is very strong, but also the red lists are included in this legislation. So this is when ICON's soft tools become hard law. Article 44 of the new German law says if an object is present on an ICON red list, it needs to be submitted to increased due diligence. We will talk about purely what due diligence is after. The third and most important factor, there wouldn't be red list and there wouldn't be looting without it, it's the market factor. These objects need to be on demand in the art market because it's the only reason why they get looted when they're in a fragile context. So we monitor the market to make sure what types of objects can be found. So they facilitate, of course, identification, seizures, and return. They're distributed to customs, to police, <coughs> auction houses, museum, but mainly customs and police are the first frontline people who need to have these tools. How do they work? Latest red list I can published is on West Africa. This is a print screen because it stayed online 48 hours. Um, this type of object is from Mali. It's exactly, it resembles so much one that is on the red list. And this is why red lists are useful because if you're a police officer, you wouldn't know what that is and you wouldn't know if it's important, precious, or you would need to protect it. So a visual aid really helps. And this sale is a global uh, African art sale. Remained, but this one item um, disappeared because we flagged it and archaeologists saw it they called us, we flagged it saying, do you have the provenance? And the provenance, interestingly enough, it was in a German collection and it's being sold in Austria. Why? Because the German law is now restrictive. So hence the importance of making sure we have uh, harmonized legislation at the regional level. So this is just to show you that they help because they're an incentive to flag something. To, to, it, the red list is a red flag that says, wait a minute, where does this come from? Do you have property title? Is it legal? We have 16 red lists from, that cover 35 countries at least, because some are regional. And they used to be, that's interesting, published in the language of the source country and of the market countries. So for example, if there's no market in Spain for Iraqi object, we wouldn't necessarily print it in Spanish. Thanks to Turkey, uh, at the time, I have to admit, we did not think how much Turkey would probably become a potential uh, place where objects would, would transit or, or where there would be a lot of pressure um, with these objects. So the, the Ministry of Culture supported the translation um, and the U.S. Department of State and with, um, of the Turkish and the Syrian red list. And now we're seeing demands for Swedish, for Greek, for many, many countries want to translate the red list because it's a global phenomenon and objects can end up any part of the world. We, uh, you can find them all online. Another example of how they work is that sometimes objects are so typical, if you have something to visually aid you at recognizing this object was um, seized in uh, London um, and will is probably uh, be restituted. And I want to encourage us with one case. It's emblematic, it's very successful, but it really shows how easy it is and how we need to cooperate. A lot of people talked about cooperation this morning. I will never stress enough how nobody can do this alone and we need interagency cooperation. This guy, um, the Fire Buddha from Afghanistan, uh, was one of the 1,500 objects that the UK restituted to the Kabul Museum. How did it work? ICOM has a red list on Afghanistan. Scotland Yard said to all their agencies, all their border control, use the Afghan red list and systematically control what comes in from Pakistan, Afghanistan, the sub-region, and compare. 
two years later, 3.4 tons of archaeological material was leaving um, the Heathrow Airport to get to Kabul. And what helped was that the British Museum had an MOU with the Kabul Museum and with the law enforcement and was able to help and, and speak in the name of the Kabul Museum. So they helped police and customs identify these objects, say, okay, this is from this region because museum professionals, curators had the expertise and then say this is authentic, this belongs there, discussed with the, the Kabul Museum. So this is very important because when we're isolated and there's no communication between the experts and the agencies, we don't get this type of success story. We are developing a new online tool with image recognition that will further help the uh, customs and police. But we have to be careful because recently I was talking um, with our American colleagues and they said for security reasons, customs agents that are on the front line, border control for example, at the desk, don't have a phone, don't have a computer, for security reasons. We usually think only um, certain parts of the world will have a digital divide and they will not be able to use um, the technology we're developing. No, we need to continue doing paper red lists for American customs agents because on the front line when they're there to identify these objects, they don't have um, a computer or a phone for security reason. So I talked quickly about the code of ethics for museum. But I think what we need to understand is there's a legal framework, it's very important, we have to abide by it. But most importantly, as museum professionals, we have to work ethically. Recently, some important museums have talked to me about acquisitions that they've made. And when I questioned um, that this was acquired, the first answer, well, it was legal. Of course, I imagine it was legal, but was it ethical? Is, is it the ethical thing to do, to buy objects that come from certain countries in certain periods and in certain times? Um, this is a question, it's the most important question, it's the last question you ask yourself, and certainly the most important one. Um, due diligence, of course, is something that should be a requirement, but ethical responsibility um, is very important. I will end with this to give us a little bit of hope that even if the situation is dramatic in certain parts of the world, we are seeing in the museum world uh, a real change. And I remember some years ago, um, Zeynep was um, part of our observatory. Turkey was a member of the International Observatory on Illicit Traffic. And uh, Zeynep was saying, was, was saying about a museum who had, um, had something illegally owned. And I used to say 15, 10 to 15 years is usually the marker where we say that there was best practice before, uh, the not so good practice before, and that the practice has improved. And when I asked, when was this, I was crossing my fingers, hoping really badly that it wasn't recent, um, and it wasn't. So most of the case we are seeing are interior to the last 10 or 15 years, so museums um, are adapting their practice. But what's striking me is that the general public it's changing the way it views cultural objects. For a long time, and still to this day, I think if we helped people not see a beautiful glass vase, antique vase, when they look at an object, but think of where it comes from. How did it get here? Why, why do I have this here? What happened for me to get it here? Was um, the soil in which it was in, was it ripped apart? Was it properly um, excavated? What, is it legally owned? Um, what are the consequences? Did, because people die for illicit traffic. Um, we were told, we were reminded this yesterday by, by Brian, um, by uh, Peter Stone, and again today, people die to protect cultural heritage. So we need to stop looking at just a beautiful object. When you look at um, an animal, when you look at uh, ivory, you think of the provenance, not so much with objects, and I think this is um, the way forward. So what's happening now? People are calling me saying I've got this at home and I don't think I should and then they send me a picture and I can see what they have um, in their uh, living rooms. Usually it's fine. Before they buy, they call us. This is new. We used to not reach the collectors or individual public. Of course they're not the most important collectors, they're the occasional collectors, but still it means the awareness raising is working. But museums are also getting anonymous packages. 
in the mail. The Kebahani has received some recently, and now what do museums do? They don't keep them. So the a very important museum in Berlin, the Pergamon Museum, in the same year received two packages like this. And they contained cuneiform tablets um, from Iraq. And the persons were saying, I shouldn't be having this. It got out of Iraq in the 60s or um, more recently. Please have it. And of course, what does the museum do? It immediately gives it back to Iraq. There's no way that they would keep it. Um, and by giving it back to the country, it increases transparency, it increases cooperation, and it increases trust. What the museums have that is their most important asset is their reputation. So it's really important that we base um, our reputation on transparency, on ethical practice, um, and on really strong cooperation with source countries. So I'm going to conclude to say that you are not alone. Um, to say that you are doing something very important in which we all have a responsibility. And I think there's still so much we could do if we all work together to increase our awareness and to improve our practice and to try to make sure we put some pressure on all aspects of it and we um, hold our um, policy makers accountable to the fact that this is an exceptional situation and it should get exceptional um, means to fight it and to prevent illicit traffic in cultural goods. Thank you.